part of identity isn't just who am I as, as Mike, it's about who am I as an Asian American. I'm Jeff Staple, designer, creative director, author, podcast host, founder of the clothing brand Staple and the design studio of the Dark Department. But before I became any of those things, I was just a first generation Asian American kid living in New Jersey. Growing up, there weren't a ton of people that looked like me. To fit in, most of us would shy away from our heritage. But when my family started taking trips to Chinatown in New York City, my eyes were opened. In the mix of a dense Chinese population full of restaurants and businesses, there was a growing community of young people who were defining their identities through skate culture, hip hop, and fashion. And soon enough, I found myself on that same journey. When I started my clothing brand, Staple, I wanted a medium to tell the stories I wanted to tell. And 25 years later, my brand has grown beyond what I could have imagined, giving me a platform to have an impact on my community. So when a surge of racism, hate, and violence towards Asian communities in America rose due to the COVID-19 pandemic, I knew I had to do something. In 2020, Puma approached Staple to work on initiatives that would positively impact the Asian community. We looked to the past for inspiration and found it from Ghidra, a civil rights newspaper for Asians in America co-founded by Mike Morase over 50 years ago. When Mike came to America in the 50s after World War II and the Japanese internment camps, he also felt the need to assimilate. But by the late 60s, he and his friends found themselves on a journey to discover and express their identities. At the height of the civil rights movement, Ghidra, the monthly for the Asian American experience, had something to say. You want to hear the whole explanation yeah. about Ghidra? The Ghidra name we picked because we wanted to have a name that had no prior association or meaning to okay. it. In the beginning, there were ideas and struggles that we were having in our own minds and maybe in small circles. But as we talked to more and more people, we realized that a lot of people were facing similar questions about mm -hmm. how do we fit in. I was born in Japan, and I came to this country with my family when I was nine. My family was getting ready to come from Japan to this country. They bought me all these books about, Here, here's America, this is what you could you know, look forward to. And every children's book that I looked at had all white people, yep. no minorities. Then I get plopped down in South Central. First, I went to an elementary school, which was mostly black. You know, at the time, I didn't speak any English at all. And they didn't have ESL, so I was thrown into a sort of an emergent situation, like learn English. For the most part, I got along pretty well with the, my black neighbors. And in fact, whenever I, I got into uh, some situation, I had some black friends who would protect me. Some of them were uh, members of a gang called Gladiators. When I went to junior high school, there were more Japanese Americans, Sansei, the third generation Japanese Americans, born here, acculturated here. Their parents coming out of camps and rebuilding their lives. Yeah. They didn't really uh, want to associate with me, an FOB. Fresh off the boat. Yeah. yeah. You know, they and their parents were told not to be so Japanese, yeah. not to congregate among Japanese. Mm -hmm. Just okay. assimilate. Just, right. So yeah. be, be as American as you can be, right. or else, you know, you might end up going to camp again. With that kind of message, they were not very friendly to an FOB. Mm -hmm. I was too Japanese mm -hmm. for them until I, you know, acculturated myself and uh, learned some English and stuff. And then I got along with the, the Japanese Americans as well. And it wasn't until I got to UCLA yeah. that I was in a predominantly white, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of a culture shock. What was your mindset going into UCLA? My eyes were open after I got to UCLA, not because of the classes I took, but because of the interactions that I had with other students mm -hmm. and, and the events on campus. But in looking back on earlier life, I could see how there were things that happened in my life that was making sense yeah, later, later on. on. Yeah. yeah. You know, when I first got there, I signed up as an engineering major. It's very uh, common for Asians yeah. and other minorities of my generation to choose uh, you know, disciplines or professions that were measurable in concrete terms. You know, things like sciences, math, engineering, they're like quantifiable things. And I think that's the kind of thing that people thought were 
were most promising careers. I agree with you that like the sort of more executive level stuff was off limits to us. We couldn't right, get right. that. But the way you just broke it down, where it's quantifiable that like you can achieve excellence in this through a number right. and it's very black and white versus creative arts, which is subjective and subject to racism and, right. and pigeonholing and stereotyping. Right. That That's amazing. In the 60s and 70s, we felt like we can create a revolutionary movement that could really change the essence of society. That's how we felt, and we thought that uh, we would ha have that kind of impact. Domestically, the civil rights movement was going on. It was developing into a more militant black liberation movement. Uh -huh. okay. But when we had demonstrations on campus, and every once in a while the police would show up and you know there'd be 200 police, all of the shots were from behind the police taking pictures of us. Uh -huh. We didn't see any of that other point of view of From us your looking at them. Yeah. The civil rights issues in, in this country and all the international situation. There are a lot of things going on that really woke us up to, you know, there's a lot more than just our yeah. family and our community, yeah, our yeah. neighborhood, that there are things going on out there that impact us. It was all coming to a head at this yeah. time. Many of us uh, felt like a lot of these struggles with identity. Who are we? How do we fit into this society? Yeah. Which was pretty much black and white at that time. Right. And one of the things that I realized, uh, and I think many of us realized, is that uh, we hadn't really learned anything about ourselves, mm -hmm. our family history, our community's history, our people's history. Yeah. That was the same for Chinese Americans. That was the same for Filipino Americans. The same for Latinos, Blacks, uh -huh. Native Americans. It's all minority people, people of color. We said, okay, let's go back to our communities and learn from our elders. We're gonna skip the secondary sources like books. Uh -huh. We're gonna go with the primary sources, people that live these lives. Yeah. The African Americans had their own campus newspaper. Mexican Americans had theirs as well. Those papers express things that you don't see on the news and on television. Yeah. They had their own point of view, chronicling various events and things. We uh, got together and said, we should be doing that ourselves and providing a vehicle for young people to express themselves in poetry, in uh, prose, in drawings and photography, all these things. And so it was twofold, like a, a medium for expression and to chronicle things. complete set of both of these. Sick. So this is all of the copies bound into a hardcover. Yeah. The newspapers are so um, delicate that I think it's better to flip through that, right? Which one's uh, the older one? Uh, let's see. This one. Okay. I think you'll start there. Anything else? Like, what's in this? Oh, that's a t-shirt from a long time ago. Oh, can we pull that out? So this is the uh, original logo that we had. This is an original t-shirt because it yeah. looks pretty raggedy. Yeah. And then these are just more of the logo? Yeah. Why a worm? A uh, worm is kind of a small version of a monster, I guess. <laughs> right. It's like a baby yeah. dragon. And it's got, the logo's got, it's carrying a sword on its yeah. back. Okay. Yeah. And it's got its fist in the air. Right. I don't know if you meant to do this, but Ghidra was really set up like a brand. Like you made logos, you made t-shirts, you made a hat. You really positioned it in a way that A, it was more easily digestible and B, was easy to spread. And I think that's why I was so enamored by what you guys were doing. The idea that messages could be passed through different mediums was yeah. really interesting to me. Yeah. Youth culture today communicates, obviously not necessarily through printed right. word, but right. social media, product, fashion, music, right? right. All of these things right. can be utilized as mediums for spreading a message. And I'm glad that you're taking some inspiration from things like Ghidra because, uh, you know, we weren't that conscious about developing a brand or like you'll see like the name Ghidra is done in different types of, yeah. you know, throughout because it was a developmental process. If you flip through all the pages from beginning to end, you'll see periods when, when uh, graphics change uh -huh. or the layouts change. There had to be like a graphic designer though. 
because this is like really well designed. Even those people went, you know, came and went, but really? we, we had a stable of um, five or six guys. Uh huh. And this was, I mean, totally pre-desktop publishing, pre-computer, right? Yeah. Cut and paste is we actually use the razor. That's what cut and paste cut is. Cut and paste from, came from today. Yeah. yeah. Cut like and paste. he literally cut right. and then scotched, like clear taped them together and then right. created this collage. What? Do you remember how many meetings it took to create Ghidra? Actually, to get to it, maybe two, three meetings, very quick, because the idea was so, uh, you know, like, so needed that yeah. uh, everybody agreed to it. We remained a monthly, so we went from April of 1969 to April of 1974. Were you printing them on campus? Was there a printer? No. You had to go off, off campus? No, in fact, when we went to the administration and said, would you let us have this newspaper? And the administration said, yes, we can pay for it, but we have to have editorial control. So we said, no, no thanks. We walked off, we raised our own money, took it off campus and uh, put it out you know, with, with our own resources. Wow. We didn't have a business model. We went on what we could do and like, you know, the 25 cents was just to get a, a little bit of change, but uh, we knew that wasn't subscription, wasn't going to support us. Uh -huh. We still had to kick in money and mm -hmm. ask for donations and such. And, and, you know, that's what we did. Do you remember at its height, like, how many copies you would be running? Normally, we ran about three to 5,000. Wow. But if there was a big demonstration coming up, we knew we were going to pass out a lot of issues there. Mm -hmm. So we print more, like 10,000 or whatever. Wow. Yeah. Did you also hand them out off campus? After a while, it was mostly off campus. Copies of Ghidra ended up in New York and in the Bay Area. And in fact, they even went to Toronto. Let's fast forward to today. Mm -hmm. We come out of a global pandemic. In my perspective, I'd, I'd like to hear from yours, but I felt like we regressed on a lot of progress that we had made as a people. I have had that thought, but I try to kind of think about it more deeply. Human progress, uh -huh. revolutionary process, is not a straight line. Yeah. It's difficult, ups and downs. Yeah. And we just have to go through all the, the downs to get, you know, to but, the up, yeah. but every time we're getting to a higher hill. Yeah, yeah. Did you feel like you set out to achieve what you set out to do? Personally, I felt like uh, we never got there, mm -hmm. but I felt like that the, the process, the journey was just as important as yeah. arriving at a destination. The act of you and me sitting down and talking about our differences, coming to a higher level of understanding, yep. and then going to act on it and say, let's go get four more people, and mm -hmm. let's go get more, 12 more people, and we're gonna get a 1,000 people yeah. at this rally. Yeah. That process and the bonds that you don't see in the pages of the newspaper, but that's with us, right. you know, that's unbreakable bonds. What we're going through now, if you're, 18 and Asian in America, you're going through it for the first time. Mm -hmm. So you're seeing all this Asian hate and you're like, this is atrocious, this is horrible. Mm -hmm. You're like, this is like the fourth rodeo. And so like you offer that sort of stability and that wisdom that we need as a younger generation to know that, like you said, this is a dip, there'll be a higher hill in the future. This is not like the dark ages, don't yeah. worry. I talked to people in high school and college and said, Give yourself permission to lead and do something. You don't say, well, I'm too young to do this. But you're never too young to lead, and I'm never too old to learn. And that's what, you know, passing it on means.